and welcome to our July Art Matters Artist Talk. I'm Kristen Butler, Director, Director of Programs here at the Delaplaine Arts Center in downtown Frederick, Maryland. Before I hand things over to our exhibitions manager, Sydney Dexter, welcome to our July introducing our speaker today. I'd like to invite you to ask questions anytime during the presentation. If you have a Google account, you can sign in and ask questions in the chat there on here on YouTube or you can email us at virtual at delaplane.org. That email address is in the chat and in the description box below. We'll be holding most questions to the end of the presentation and discussion, but you're welcome to ask them anytime. And with that, let me hand things over to Sydney. Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in and thank you to the members of Gaithersburg Camera Club for presenting today. Their group exhibition features over 70 engaging photographs created by the club's regional artist members. Um, and with that, we welcome our first speaker, member and club president, Cora Rosenhaft. Hello, I'm Cora Rosenhaft. I'm the president of the Gaithersburg Camera Club. The Gaithersburg Camera Club was founded in 1973. We have members from throughout Montgomery County and members are a variety of, of ages and backgrounds. For 47 years, we've provided opportunities for members to grow and improve their photography skills. We meet twice a month from September to June at the Asbury Retirement Village on, in normal times. Um, since the pandemic, we've been meeting virtually. We meet twice a month on the first meeting is the second Monday when we have a presentation, a guest speaker comes and presents on a variety of topics that appeal to both beginner and advanced photographers. On the fourth Monday of the month, we have our competition meetings where members can compete with each other and get feedback from um, judges about their images. Even if a member is not interested in competing, they learn a lot by just listening to the judges critique the other images in, at the meeting. Another great opportunity the camera club gives our members are field trips. Um, some of the field trips we've been on recently have been to the George Washington Farm, the Franciscan Monastery, the Maryland Renaissance Festival, and the Lyconing Silk Mill. It's, these field trips are not only an opportunity for our members to get out and take pictures that they might not be able to do on their own, but it's a great opportunity for us to learn from each other. We have a wide variety of skill levels from beginners to advanced. And as you can see from looking at the exhibit and the virtual exhibit, we have some very talented photographers. And these field trips are a great time to ask them questions or ask them advice. And they've all been very generous with sharing. So it's if, if you are a member of any kind of camera club, I recommend you really take advantage of, of field trips. If you want more information about the Gaithersburg Camera Club, our website is Gaithersburg Camera Club, Gaithersburg Camera Club org. And um, I'm looking forward to the presentation by our members, Wendy and David and Howard. Thank you. David, you ready? Yes. Okay, can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Okay, so um, so my name is David DePaola and I'm part of the Gaithersburg Camera Club and you can find me at storyinart.com and, and also on Etsy. So I wanted to go over some of the photography lessons learned that I gained from the Gaithersburg Camera Club. And um, I can tell you that this club has been instrumental in me growing as a photographer. And so some of the things I've learned is really to practice your skills and know your camera like it's the back of your hand. Um, and also get yourself in position uh, just at the right time. Two very, very important things. And also choose flattering light. Choose to go out when the light is in your favor and then try to take uh, images of lights or, or of objects uh, that are well lit. Uh, wait for the moment, and, and I'm gonna get into that in just a little bit more detail, and take many shots. Uh, Cause you'll be surprised that when you go through the shots, what you find. 
So I want to talk about one of my favorite images, and this was actually featured in Nat Geo. And this is of a mother bear and her cub. And the story behind this image is, is, is that we were at Alligator River and we were across a stream. So we had a good natural barrier and mom was going about her business uh, just with her cubs feeding. And then all of a sudden she started to charge and we were very prepared. We just got into the vehicle. She came, she ran down the field, crossed the bridge, came to the car, it took her like 30 uh, seconds to do this. And she smelled our car, saw that we were no threat and then went back to her cubs. And ever since then, she accepted us. She didn't show one shy sign of stress that we were there. And we got to take many photographs. And waiting for the moment, uh, we took photographs for about 30 minutes. And then another car pulled up behind me. And she stood up with her cub. And, and, and I was able to capture this moment. So waiting can really pay off. Also, you want to get yourself in position. So the story behind this photograph was, um, uh, so this was taken uh, just in Acadia National Park. And during the day, I scoped out this location. I used an app to find out where the Milky Way would be and came to this location um, after nightfall. And the Milky Way was brilliant in the sky. And if I hadn't scoped it out during the day, it would have been very difficult because it was so dark. And I actually got lucky, again, waiting for the moment. A car came by while I was um, actually taking exposure and lit the foreground. And that's why you actually see the foreground in this photo. And in my other photos, the light I had wasn't strong enough to actually illuminate the foreground because it was just so dark. And so again, um, getting that light, um, fortunately, was by accident and then waiting for the moment. Here's another example of trying to position yourself uh, you know, the best you can. So I actually chose to go to Alaska during a solar storm and I purposely chose the seat on my flight on the right hand side so I would have an eastern north view of the sky when we came into Anchorage. And uh, I blacked out the window of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, window, put my camera right up to it and I got this beautiful picture of the Northern Lights just with the wing in view. And another um, reason why you wanna take many shots and, and wait, this photo was taken uh, just at Conowingo Dam and I probably took a thousand shots this day and I waited about six hours for this moment that literally took place in about two seconds. And I was there, I was ready, I knew the skills of my camera, everything was set up, everything was well practiced, and I was able to capture the shot. So back to Alligator River, one of the things that you want to do is really let your animals get to know you. And we got to know this bear over the course of two days. She felt very, very comfortable with us, um, but we always stayed very close to the car. And uh, and she was very interested in actually. Um, uh, she felt very comfortable with us. She brought her cubs out. And, uh, you know, we always stayed about 30 yards away. That's a very healthy distance. So we keep our distance. We're always very respectful of the animals. Uh, you can actually see my daughters in the back of the car. That's our escape plan. Uh, if the mother decides that she uh, uh, is threatened, I just close the hatch and then jump in the car. And we're good to go in about four seconds, which at 30 yards, it, you know, you know, it would take her about 15 to 20 seconds to get to us. Um, and know the warning signs. Um, a black bear will slap their jaw, they'll slap the ground. If you see any warning signs back up, uh, you haven't given them enough space, you've gotten to know them too quickly, um, and so give them their space. Uh, let them come to you. This bear actually came to us. And all the bears that you see, they come to us, we don't go to them. So uh, this is an interesting story. Um, in Taiwan, I went to Elephant Mountain and you hike these 600 steps in like uh, just 100% relative humidity. It's usually about 90 plus degrees. By the time you get to the top, you're breathing heavy, you're sweating. 
And uh, this was an opportunity that I actually missed. I actually only got the first two thirds of this photo, just the cityscape. And when I got home, I looked at my phone and saw, oh, I missed the foreground. So what did I do? Next night, I went back. And I actually went back, got the foreground and got this image and was able to uh, merge it because it was a pan, uh, just because it was a panorama. Uh, you know, this is actually a composite of uh, six to eight images. Um, so again, taking many shots and waiting for the moment. Uh, this is a lava tube in Hawaii. And I actually got frustrated taking the shot because so many people asked me to put my camera down and take their photos. And there was such a crowd and I had to wait for the crowd to dissipate. Um, but as this was happening, the sunset occurred and the sky got more and more beautiful. And just when everyone disappeared, I took a number of images, but in this particular image, the wave was uh, particularly beautiful and it was captured crystal clear. Uh, some of the other images were blurry uh, just with the wave because I was shooting at a lower shutter speed because of the darkness. Um, so, uh, you know, again, knowing your camera, waiting for the moment and getting yourself in position. Uh, this is another uh, example of being ready to improvise when you get to your location. So uh, this is of Shanghai, a cityscape. And when I got to the location, we had to fight the crowds to one, get to the location. And once we got to the location, it was like people everywhere. I didn't feel comfortable setting up my tripod, getting everything ready. So what I did was I used the 50 millimeter lens, which I know well, and I know I can take a, pan, a, a, a panorama by just moving my body very still. And, uh, you know, by just rotating my body, but keeping everything else still. And uh, I, again, waited for the moment so the clouds were in my favor. And, and I believe the clouds make this photo. So uh, with that, I wanted to, one, thank the audience for attending, as well as thank uh, the uh, Delaplane Art Center for having us. It's an absolutely wonderful exhibit. And uh, I took the whole family and we saw all their various shows and I couldn't uh, just recommend it more highly. So with that, I will turn it um, over to Wendy. I'm gonna stop sharing. Hi, my name is Wendy DeNova Wimmer. Today I'd like to discuss my journey in photography. Like many photographers, photography is about telling a story, whether it is about a place, a certain subject, ourselves, or someone else. I've been shooting pictures since I was in high school and I experimented with film and slides through college. Once I had kids, my photography revolved around the family. Action photography was a must, but someone always had to be a ham. We always photograph food and farmer's markets on our travels. It might be because my grandpa was a produce man or his father was a fisherman in Sicily. Maybe we all cho choose our subjects that create the most emotion for us. Italy was great. Tons of food, Parmesan cheese, noodles galore, tortellinis and bologna. The transition to digital photography created a new story for me. After 9-11, I became a multimedia forensic analyst and I spent the next 20 years enhancing and analyzing other people's photographs to tell a story, good or bad. Our stories, characters, can be the color, light, motion, or the perspective. Sometimes we photograph disappearing islands and their occupants. I was, I was lucky to take two trips before we were locked down this year. My first was in the fall 
to Israel and Jordan. The immense amount of history was amazing. I found the desert and stones challenging to photograph. We were constantly moving on the trip, so you never could go back and do more or wait for the light. You were there when you were there. The Sea of Galilee, one of the summer homes, mixing in with the modern stuff. This was some great Roman ruins. This is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. You were at a far angle from them on another canyon taking photos. I only carried two lenses with me the whole time. And then Petra, a lot of people there, so hard to photograph and get areas all by yourself. The lighting was amazing. A lot of stone, the carving was amazing. It was great to see the people who lived there. These kids were uh, counting their money for the day. This young woman gave us a shortcut through some of the um, rooms so we could, um, instead of climbing over another one, and we gave her a little money. She asked me for my Superman watch. A lot of ways to travel. And then I was intrigued about shooting these horses in the canyons. You were shooting around tons of people and these horses were flying by, so you were constantly jumping out of the way. My next trip took me to the other extreme in weather and scenery, Iceland. Iceland has such a variety of, to photograph, but also difficult besides your fingers freezing, always trying to shoot the steam at the right level when you're up against the gray skies or the snow of the background. This spot we showed up a few times. Um, again, the steam was really always difficult to shoot against the sky, but it was so intriguing. On a rainy, snowy day, we found this little hut, reminded me of um, the Hobbit, and the horse came up behind it. This was at the place we were staying. The gentleman smoked trout with sheep dung. There's really no wood around. These horses came to play on the rainy day. This was behind the place we stayed. This boat looks very different at night. I'm jealous of David. We had one night out of the week we were there that the um, northern lights were actually very active. So we all went out about one in the morning, um, had about 15 to 30 second exposures to get these. Not overly active, but it was great to finally see. I hope to go back and shoot more. This is an image that I have in the show. It was the first day, very cold. This is, was a beautiful falls, um, trying to get my tripod set up without my fingers freezing. This image just seemed to asked to be black and white. This is a trip we went to South Dakota as the Gaithersburg Camera Club. It's a great club. It's a great place to learn and be challenged. The members are a wealth of knowledge and each one is a great photographer. It is a great community. I consider many of my mentors Photography has changed so much since the days of film. In today's digital world, I think a lot about the pixel. Do I have enough of them? If I enhance any of my pixels, will I move them or change them? With image editing software like Adobe Photoshop, we can add pixels and we can manipulate our photos to become unrecognizable. I often debate when a photograph should no longer be considered a photograph but more of an artistic image. Technology is taking more control of our images. Cameras now include stabilization and autofocus. Your cell phone's camera is getting more sophisticated. Image editing software now includes artificial intelligence that will replace the sky or composite a 3D object into the image. I have always been fascinated by computer graphics and I have been experimenting with 360 video cameras virtual reality, and augmented reality. Who knows what our photographs will be like in the future and how they will be displayed. But at the end of the day, 
Sometimes we just photograph the things that make us smile. I would like to take a moment to thank Della Plain for hosting our show. And thank you to the Gaithersburg Camera Club and the volunteers, Barry and Nancy, for organizing the show and allowing me to speak today. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Yep. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Howard Clark, and uh, very happy to uh, participate in this artist's talk. I've been a member of the Gaithersburg Camera Club since 1973. So that's about 47 years, I think, uh, Cora calculated. But I'm also a member of two other camera clubs and two art associations. And the fact that I'm in these uh, various groups gives me sort of a foot in one in both camps, the artists and the photographers. And my slides are not advancing. That's bad news. Hmm. I'm going to stop the share and restart. Let's start from somewhere else. All right, we're back on track. <clears throat> As I say, I wanted to uh, compare some of the similarities and differences between the way that photographers work and painters work. And we'll start with similarities. Uh, most of the time, photographers and uh, painters are kind of running around everywhere looking for subject matter that they can either photograph or paint. Sometimes we're off to uh, national parks or local parks, state parks, uh, wherever we can find some useful subjects. Sometimes we go off on field trips, vacations, uh, paint outs for the, for the painters, <clears throat> uh, field trips for the camera club members, uh, barn tours for both. You find out both the photographers and the uh, painters at the barn tours. Uh, sometimes we just sit around at home and explore travel brochures to decide where we might want to go or what we might want to paint because sometimes people tear the pictures out of the uh, brochure and say that's going to be my subject. Uh, it works. But uh, one of the things that uh, we have in common is that most of us are out looking for subjects. We're looking for the found subjects and that's the case with this particular image of mine. It was taken over in Santorini, Greece, looking out of a restaurant, an open air restaurant. We were just uh, sitting up there having lunch and by the railing so that there was nothing in the way. And you look down and say, hey, that's a pretty nice scene. I better get up the camera and uh, see if I can get a picture of it. But this is one of those found situations. Um, it's a nice picture, but I think there's two lessons you can take away from this. Number one, Santorini's a really good place if you want to go take pictures. And the second thing is that average light produces average pictures. There is no brilliant uh, sunshine, sunrise, sunset here. There's no blue sky. Uh, there's no drama. It's an interesting picture, but it isn't a great picture. Uh, if you're going to look for great pictures, uh, you need an opportunity to have fantastic light. You want to have a really good subject. You want to have um, good timing. And that's what happens when Larry Dean goes on a trip. Here's his photo of the uh, Australian pelican. Just right place, right time, right instant. The lighting is fantastic. Look at the detail in there. It's all there. The color, the, you can count the hairs on the side of his cheeks. Uh, feathers are just perfect focus. It's really well done. 
another example of this right place, right time is uh, Elliot Higgins, a photograph of a couple of uh, hummingbirds. Look at how they're frozen in time. The wings are steady still on the one at the top and they're curled up on the one at the bottom. Uh, takes a really fast shutter speed or fast light if you're going to do that. I think it's light that's fast, not the shutter speed. But uh, it's the right time, the right place, no distractions, good lighting, uh, something to be emulated by all of us. Here's another case of a found subject with fantastic light, fantastic subject, uh, right place, right time. It's a nice uh, landscape. Uh, you notice foreground here, there's a place for the viewer to stand and look at this image. Uh, I don't much care for landscapes that don't have foreground in them. You've got to have a place to stand. The viewer feels like he's part of your picture uh, right in it when you have uh, the place for them to stand in the foreground. There's a rule that uh, I carry around with me, and that's that foregrounds make landscapes. Backgrounds make close-ups. Look at the background here. Look at the background there. There's no distractions in that case. And a nice foreground here. But well, what about differences between photographers and painters? I think the key difference is that painters work in an additive process and photographers work in a subtractive process. And what do I mean? When you look at a painter, he starts or she starts with a clear uh, palette. There, there's nothing in front of them. The canvas is empty. The sketch pad is empty. But then they put on some lines and they might sketch in a mountain or sketch in a tree, put some branches, the trunk of the tree. And then they're going to uh, add some leaves to the tree, add some color to the leaves, put some detail in the uh, bark of the tree. But they're building from nothing. They might have had a picture they're looking at and trying to copy and emulate. That's fine. That's the found picture but they go beyond the found picture and make something else which is their version of that image. Photographers, on the other hand, are challenged because we see a huge world out in front of us. And somewhere we have to narrow it down to a subject, to a particular scene. Uh, well, how are you gonna do that? If you remember the, uh, maybe you never heard of him, Robert Kappa, he was a very, a prominent Hungarian war photographer back in the 1940s. And uh, he told people that uh, if your pictures aren't good enough, you gotta get closer. You're not close enough yet. So here's a view out the hotel window in Philadelphia. Uh, it's a very broad view, uh, nice picture. There's a museum of modern art up in the, uh, whatever it's because museum, art museum up at the top of the picture. It's a gorgeous boulevard coming down to the uh, fountain and uh, if you wanna reduce what you're looking at, uh, get closer to your subject, you put it on the telephoto lens. Now we have a set of uh, concentric circles uh, and diagonals bringing us into there. There's action in the picture. There are people in the picture. It's got a real story to tell. Uh, this is getting much closer to uh, Kappa's ideas of uh, what you're gonna need for a good picture. Get rid of most of the world. But if you get down on the ground level, you can get rid of even more of the world. Now here we are at the ground level, it's still night, but uh, we're seeing a, this fountain up close. There's some distracting elements. Uh, it lets you know you're in the city and it lets you know there's some live plants around, that's good. Uh, it's not just concrete and sculpture. But if you get really close, one more step, then you've locked in a specific subject beautiful surroundings, no distractions, and uh, it's the process that photographers can use. Now, this business of narrowing in and excluding the part of the world that you don't want is something that uh, a lot of members of Gaithersburg Camera Club have done very, very well. Look at this image from Susan Lugener the swallowtail butterfly on top of the sunflower. There are just no distractions there. 
and you got, here's the story. It's all there. Beautiful shot. Regine Gillen uh, has this gorgeous lily, white. Can you imagine getting all of the different shades and tones of the uh, lily done in black and white? It's, it's nicely done. How about Judy MacArthur's shot here of the uh, Gerbera daisy? Wow. From underneath, transmitted light in this case. But the rest of the world is excluded. It's down to one subject and done so well. Look at how sharp that picture is. Incredible. And uh, another observation that I want to bring to your attention. I said in the beginning, most of the painters and the photographers are out looking for something to photograph. Not everyone. There are some creative people who say, I'm going to make the photograph, not take the photograph. And that's the case that we see here with uh, Sabine Dickens. She brought each of these pieces together. She put them in the place she wanted them. She lit it beautifully, excluded everything except what she wanted you to see, photographed it superbly. That's the case where we're making the picture and uh, creating the record uh, in an expert method. All right, final thoughts. Um, as we said, I've been in the camera club since uh, its very beginnings. I've seen it grow from uh, a few people meeting in my living room to uh, 100 people or more uh, currently members. The quality of photography has never been what it is now. There are so many really good photographers in that club. But that doesn't rule out others who are absolute, you know, I got my first camera last week uh, from participating because there's a tremendous amount of knowledge available to you. Just ask, listen to the presentations, listen to the judges' comments. Uh, we have a library that people can borrow books and books and books. Uh, the club is a main resource, a major resource for photographers that want to learn, uh, want to grow. So I am a strong advocate of joining camera clubs. I'm in three. Uh, Gaithersburg is uh, my number one. And I need to thank uh, the team that put this uh, presentation together, uh, Nancy and Barry. They are our leaders for exhibitions. They have done a wonderful job here with uh, the support of uh, Della Plains staff members and many others in the uh, club. With that, I conclude and turn it over to Sydney, I guess. I'll stop sharing. Now that everyone's presented, we'd like to take this time to open up the discussion regarding either individual artist experience or the collective experience as club members, as well as any commentary regarding topics or images shared thus far. Um, and then we'll follow with possible questions. Um, so anybody who would like to start that discussion, go ahead. So one of the things I wanna highlight is the light that Howard uh, and Wendy and I all talked about, flattering light can really uh, just make the photograph. It really, like Howard said, takes you from average to extraordinary. And, and I wanna point to one of the pictures that uh, Wendy showed, where she showed a picture of a rowboat uh, in a sea during the day, and then showed it with Northern Lights. And the two contrasting pictures uh, one was more average, one was one that you can put into a gallery. Um, and so really finding that flattering light is really one of the keys to photography. I would also say on that one, what's interesting, it, you give the same, or you give, say, Gaithersburg Camera Club an object to shoot, and everybody's going to shoot it differently in the different light. Um, different positions and everything else. I think that's 
always one of the exciting things um, when I take classes or whatever, you, you might have the same subject, but the creativity is just all over the place. Yeah, and that leads to what um, Howard said around perspective, right? And so when you go on a trip, for example, with a bunch of photographers, they spread out and they get these different perspectives. One can be far away, one can be close up, one can be looking at it from a different angle, one can be looking down, one can be looking up. Um, and all of those really unique perspectives can really, you know, even if a object is photographed multiple times, if, if you're able to find that unique perspective, uh, then you can make it your own. Right. The flowers that Howard was showing in the show are just absolutely beautiful. Um, I'd like to do some more macro lens shooting. I, just, I never seem to find that time to get it all together, but I need to do that. It's so uh, I wish I had more time to uh, bring in more of the pictures, but uh, uh, I walked through the exhibit uh, last weekend on Sunday and uh, had a pad and paper with me and went looking around to see which ones uh, really struck me and then uh, begged some folks to let me use your pictures. Uh, David, I appreciated your uh, reference in Taipei of getting up there and looking at the image and saying, wow, it's a great image, but there's no foreground. You gotta have foreground for landscapes. Mm -hmm. And you went back and did it again. Great. Yeah, and uh, you know, telling the story, um, if we go back to one of the pictures that Howard showed um, of the sunflower with the butterfly on it, the, uh, the uh, tiger butterfly. And, you know, I've seen many, many photographs of uh, sunflowers, but when you have an interesting element that brings an element of story to it, it really captures the audience's attention. And so, you know, the more you can bring story into your work, uh, uh, somewhat similar to what uh, Wendy did, and, and you know, the shack um, stands out to me. Uh, yeah, you know, it wasn't particularly, you know, maybe not the best time of day, but the story behind it is so interesting because you have this, this shack in the middle of um, a landscape, but then you have this horse <laughs> peering over the side, and it's just such an interesting photo like why is there a horse in the photo is that a wild horse is it a you know is it a horse from the owner of the shack and, and then you begin to ask questions and um, when you can really get your audience asking questions about your work and interested in your work and well how did they do that and how how were they able to like you know the one photo with the black background and the beautiful flower you know I think to myself how did she do that how did you get it so sharp with the dark background and and have the light and like and and you know i've done this type of work before and i don't know how she did it so I'm <laughs> yeah. you know, how did she get it so beautifully done and when you can do that for your audience it just really makes a photo mm -hmm. going back to uh, susan's picture of the butterfly on the the flower if it were just the flower alone, it would have been a very nice picture. But the butterfly is the cherry on top of the ice cream sundae. It's what really adds and makes it complete and whole. Uh, it's the extra piece in the picture, the extra element. And that moves you from a good picture to a great picture. How you get there? I always say that uh, life is about 40% of luck, but photography too, or any other thing that you do, you know, you just happen to be there. You, you waited six hours and you finally got to see those eagles, you know, come together fighting over that fish. Um, some people might be there 20 hours and never see that. Yeah. Great. Michael Brown didn't plan when he was going to find that wall, wall uh, <laughs> coming at him. He was just there, the right time, the right place. But I guarantee you, if Michael Brown had been sitting in front of his computer playing uh, on the keyboard, he wouldn't have found that picture. You've got to be there. Yeah. Date and be there. Yeah. Well, that leads, oh, go ahead, David. I'll, I'll ask next. Um, so, so I wanted to build on something that Wendy said. Uh, she, she, she said that she traveled with two lenses 
throughout, I believe it was um, Europe or, uh, you know, uh, maybe even the Middle East. And what that does is that allows you to pack light and always be prepared. So when I tra traveled through China, um, I mostly used a 50 millimeter lens. And when I had larger landscapes, I did panos. And I knew exactly how to do that because I knew my equipment. Um, but always being ready. And when you look at some of those stories that Wendy was able to tell, she was always prepared because she packed light and she was ready to go. And it's because you don't know when it's going to happen. That moment can be spontaneous. And, and I look at some of the images of the food and I'm like, wow, that's really nice light, really beautiful photo. But she was there and she was prepared uh, with her camera. Thank you. One of the questions I have for you, David, is on the night photography. Yes. So if you went back, you know, 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. could you do could you do the Milky Way as well without, you know, your app pointing you to the, <laughs> the Milky Way and where it's going to sit? Um, I'm always intrigued by the night photography. I'd like to try more. Of course, we're in such a bright location here. I have to get in the car and go someplace. So, um, so it, so technology makes it much easier. Um, you can still find out the relative locations in books because fortunately our universe follows a very, very clear set of science, uh, scientific rules. But what technology does is just makes it far easier. So I've talked to people and they say, how did you capture the Northern Lights? I've gone to Alaska three or four times and I've never seen them. Well, I watched the forecasts and I went during a solar storm on purpose. Um, and when um, you, know, you take a picture of the Milky Way, you know it's gonna be up above the horizon starting somewhere I believe in the March uh, timeframe and then it disappears sometime in November. And you know it's going to be in the southeast type region based on books. So then you can then take your compass and you can then uh, try to position yourself. And then scoping out a location also helps. So you can go the night before, maybe there's a moon or a partial moon, and you can just see, but then plan ahead for that and practice so that when you come to that spot, when it's prime time, that you're ready and that's knowing your equipment. And, and that's how I do it. Like I'm planning right now to scope out a location tomorrow so that in one week, I'm ready to take the Milky Way at Wallops Island. Oh, nice. I hear the Northern Lights aren't gonna be as active for the next, uh, until 2025. I'm kind of bummed on that. I can't wait that long. Yeah, so uh, uh, so a couple cool events. So there's going to be another solar eclipse, I believe it's in uh, 2024, and then the lights will start to become more active. But keep this in mind: in the low period of a solar minimum, you have the chance for very very big storms. So Northern Lights, best place in America is Alaska, Fairbanks, because they're overhead and they're beautiful and position yourself between February and March or September and August. And it's just too cold during uh, December and uh, January. And, you know, I like what Wendy said when she said, you know, my fingers were freezing and I was trying to use my equipment when I was in Alaska and it was minus 20. Being prepared and being ready for those elements and being able to work your equipment in those elements is really key because if you're struggling with your equipment, that can make the, the, uh, the uh, picture very difficult to take. I just wanted to add one thing. There's some very nice um, examples we've had all over the world, but you don't need to go all over the world. Sometimes the best place to start is your own backyard because that is what you know. You know the plants and animals. I know when I first, started trying to take pictures of birds. I'm, I'm not as um, experienced with wildlife photography as David and some other members of the club, but I started with Canadian geese because they're in my backyard. I can go and learn everything I need to know about that group of geese that are in the pond behind my house. And then I can take the knowledge I got from that and move up to another maybe more exotic bird or when I go on that big trip 
and have the chance to see other kinds of wildlife, I, I'm used to wildlife in general. So I don't want everyone looking at these pictures and saying, man, I can't go see the Northern Lights or I can't go to the Middle East. Do I have a chance? And you, you get familiar with your equipment, you get familiar with your environment. And then when you do get a chance to go somewhere, you won't miss the moment as David was talking about earlier. So, so, so Cora, I have a picture that illustrates that point exactly. So if I can just share my screen just for a moment and if I can just highlight this, this photograph here was taken literally 200 yards from my house. And this mother deer just gave birth to this baby and it's literally two hours old and this is its first stand. And we happened upon this, um, this deer and she led us um, into her world and we went back, got the camera, came back and we were able to capture that. So. You don't have to go far in order to capture that. And some of my most favorite photos are literally within a five mile radius of my house. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Especially this time we've all been locked in. I know a lot of people have been looking out their windows, shooting different things in their backyard or wherever. Friend from Frederick used to go off on a photo walk every day, 365 days a year. And uh, she didn't walk too far, <laughs> but she was able to fill 365 days with different pictures. Some of them are pretty good. It's really neat. Yeah, and um, one thing interesting, uh, my daughter and I had gone to a park about an hour away and we were looking for barred owls. And we came home and there's a and, and there's this wooded area right behind our neighborhood pool. And I said, Chloe, let's stop and see if the fox is around um, that particular area, because sometimes we see the fox. And we went in and we saw a family of barred owls. So we traveled an hour and then we came back to our local neighborhood, found, found the barred owls, went home, got the camera quickly, came back and got beautiful pictures of the baby barred owl literally about three minutes from our house. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, animals actually love neighborhoods because they keep predators away. And uh, owls in particular love fields. And so uh, you can find them very close to your home. Wonder if there were any questions that came in. Sydney, did you get any questions from people? Yeah, it doesn't look like we have any questions, um, but before we conclude, I just wanted to remind viewers that the uh, Gaithersburg Camera Club members exhibition is also presented virtually through Virtual Delaplane, uh, which is available on our website at delaplane.org. So if you can't make it in by the 26th, or if you'd like to visit as many times as you please without walking through the doors, then the virtual exhibition is a great alternative. Want to show one or two views of that? Um, I think for time's sake, maybe not, but I do encourage everybody to go to our website and check that out. And I thank you all for presenting today. Um, and we will follow up with anybody's questions if they have them following the conclusion. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chris, thanks. Thanks so much to all of our uh, panelists today and thank you to all of our viewers who joined us for watching. Uh, please feel free to keep commenting. Um, after we end the live stream, the chat will end, but then a comment section will open up and so you can share your comments there. And of course, you're also welcome to share your uh, comments and questions at virtual at delaplane.org. Um, if you enjoyed what you saw today, again, please come and visit the exhibition or uh, check out the exhibition, uh, virtual exhibition via our website um, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, hit the notification bell to get alerts whenever we upload a new video. And thank you all again so much for coming today and enjoy this beautiful day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.